there's a Simone Veil quote um, where she like I think she says attention taken to its highest degree is like the same thing as prayer or something like that. So I wow. do think that it, it there there is something profound about like being able to focus one's attention with one's whole self on one thing, you know. If you have ever procrastinated on the internet, then you'll probably relate to this conversation with Jordan Castro. He is a novelist whose debut novel is actually called The Novelist, and it is just fascinating. The story is set over the course of a single morning where a writer is trying to pen an autobiographical novel in Google Docs, but he just keeps getting distracted by Twitter, Instagram, daily rituals, and his own mind. Each act of procrastination prompts an intriguing and often comedic psychic reflection on the nature of language, consciousness, technology, and addiction. Now, in our conversation, we discuss Jordan's book and dive into a number of tangential topics, such as the power of saying a lot, using very little, attention spans, and whether they are actually on the decline, social media, and how as we build it, it is building us, drug addiction and lessons from sobriety, infinite universe theory and what it means for the novel, and lots more. What struck me about Jordan was not just how he thinks, but also his humility. He's a really chilled out guy and has a rare talent for traversing complex terrain in a way that's light, memorable, and super fun. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Now, without further ado, here's Jordan Castro. Jordan, what does fiction mean to you? Oh, 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 we're recording now. Okay, cool, <laughs> yeah. cool. I, I, all right, all right. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, like I said, I asked a bunch of my friends last night who I'm with who, who are writers uh, what they thought, because I was like, what does fiction mean to me? Um, and my friend Scott McClanahan said, uh, he said, fiction versus nonfiction is, is basically just means the difference between 1695 and 2795. And I thought that was pretty good. So I'll, I'll go with that. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Shout out. What's his name? Scott? Scott. Yeah. Shout out Scott McLean. Shout out yeah. Scott. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. So I'd love to hear about, I don't know about your journey as a writer. First, if you could clarify something for me, um, it, so it sounds like you started literary life as a poet, right? Um, before you were writing um, novels. Um, could you take us through that a little bit? Like, how did you start writing poetry, your inspiration, uh, just journey? Yeah. I mean, I, I started writing poems when I was really young. Like, um, like when I was like maybe 12, I would write these like political essays because I was like reading all this political theory stuff that was like going over my head. And then my cousin and my brother started a punk band. And so I like my first kind of experience of um uh, semi-adult creative writing was like tr transforming these like political essays into like punk lyrics or whatever so that may have been and before then when I was like really young I was into rap music and so I was like writing my own like raps and so, and so on but I think like when I really started writing poetry was like I started reading a lot when I was like like of like fiction and poetry when I was in like eighth grade or something like that and um I don't know I always just was sort of attracted to like um uh, trying to do a lot in a, in a small space, you know, like even when I started writing fiction, I was like really attracted to stories by like Lydia Davis that are only like, you know, a paragraph long or a couple paragraphs long and um, just trying to do a lot and in a little bit of, uh, you know, with, with as few words as possible. And I, I don't know why I, I, I like that. I mean, I think when I was younger, it was sort of like a lack of skill, if I'm being honest, like <laughs> I couldn't, you know, I couldn't write, I would try and write fiction um, and it just wasn't very good. And I think like poems, like the unit of a poem was something I could sort of manage. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, I mean, the pessimistic view is sort of that, like I, when I was younger, you know, I just wanted to like express myself or like express my feelings or something like that. And poetry lent itself well to that because you could, I, you know, I could write like, um, you know, experimentally or like in free verse or something. And I didn't have to like, 
pay too much attention to the craft, you know? Um, and, but as I got older and, and started becoming more serious about fiction, I think like the, the practice of, um, sort of trying to, um, say as much as I could, you know, with sort of maximum efficiency or something like that was, was, um, was useful. Yeah, I really relate to that, man. I think uh, I have this uh, badly worded uh, draft tweet, I think, from quite a while ago that you just for some reason like reminded me of um, about like how I feel a lot more haiku poets in the world uh, should become novelists and they should write fiction mm-hmm. because I feel like they've just understood the art and beauty of compression. More than compression, distillation. Right. Like Mm -hmm. just taking something really, really complex and distilling it to its essence. And there's not like no fat in the sentences or lines. Right. There's not you couldn't add a word or take away a word. It's just absolutely uh, perfect. And I feel like, um, yeah, you know, (laughs) and a lot of my a lot of my favorite writers were of favorite novelists were poets first, like Thomas Bernhard wrote poetry. And then he, I think, took a break for like 10 years and then. I think his first novel, he like rearranged a poem or like used some of a poem and created the novel Frost. And Ben Lerner is another writer that I like, and he, you know, was a po- is a poet. Um, and so I think there's definitely uh, Tao Lin is a writer who a friend of mine who like really inspired me. And he, I think his first book was a book of poetry. And so I think uh, there is something to that for sure. Yeah, I think it's even a, a broader principle lesson for the world, right? Like just like being a uh sounds really dry but resource efficient like economical uh, achieving a lot with little i think that's if we can do that that's that's great that's kind of one of big issues with consumerism today right like we just like we we using a lot of stuff and we don't seem to be getting that much out of it totally totally and i think i think too like there's something to be said just for the simple fact of like you know i don't like being bored when i read and i think like people think that it's sort of um maybe like a low brow or like a, an unintelligent thing to say where it's like, I just thought that was boring. But for yeah. me, like I, there, you know, there are times when I, when I'm reading, I'm like, man, this is boring, you know? And yeah. I think like, I'm very aware of like wanting to be entertaining and also like maximally meaningful and so on. Um, and not just not waste anybody's time. You know, you're sort of making a claim to people's time when you say like, this is worth reading. And I think, um, yeah, it's just useful to, to try and pack it in there. Yeah, I think that's that's a really noble thing, actually, just to be respectful of people's time, right? If they're going to invest like a couple of hours in your work, your product or whatever, like it should be meaningful, right? There should be some kind of like a uh, good return on that. Um, mm. you, you reminded me of something, actually. Again, I think part of that like draft tweet, um, something just generally to do with attention. Everyone, um, firstly, do you, what's your take on attention, uh, especially given... Um, the novelist, uh, the book that you've just written. Do you, do you feel like some, cause I'm a little split on this. Sometimes I feel like we've heard that attention spans are declining from, you know, so many different directions that I just believe and taken for granted that they are. And sometimes I question like, are they actually, or is there something else at play? Uh, what's your take on attention mm-hmm. generally? Um, I like, well, I really like, um, there's a Simone Weil quote, um, where she like, I think she says attention taken to its highest degree is like the same thing as prayer or something like that. So I do think that there, there is something profound about like being able to focus one's attention with one's whole self on one thing, you know? And so like there is, and I also, uh, uh, I haven't thought of this stuff before, so I'm just spitting, but I, but there's also, you know, there's this idea in, in, or the, you know, what the Latin satanas for satan is uh means the scatterer you know and so i think there's this there is something true about (laughs) like um you know about (laughs) about like this you know that that like when one is scattered um you know that 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 all kinds of, of 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 bad things can happen um or you know you're not you're not you're sort of sacrificing a certain um truth or serenity or something um and you're sort of like undifferentiated and like all over the place and i think that that is generally speaking not good um but that being said i i do i hear that all the time where people are like yeah people's attention spans are bad like what does it you know what does this mean for the novel and will people even be able to sit down and read right 
And it reminds me of like when when I was younger, they were the first kid I ever knew who had like ADHD. It was this kid? I think his name was like Brandon, and like he would he would um, you know, he like couldn't pay attention in class and couldn't sit down and all this stuff. And then we would like get on the bus, and he would just zoom like go like this and just focus with like his whole attention on this video game that he really liked, you know. And so I think like there, you know, um, I think maybe our attention is on different things or something like that. But I don't, I don't know. I don't really see like, and there are still like long novels that are getting published and people are reading them and stuff like that. I think what more concerns me than like the, uh, the sort of attention span um, argument or something is like, is, is, is just what people are paying attention to. I think like, right. It's less that it's le it's less that social media, or you know the internet, um, um, makes us unable to pay attention. But I think the 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 thing that concerns me is that the thing that we're paying attention to is like other people. So like it's sort of you're sort of constantly logging into this like social space and like worrying what people think about you and worrying about how you seem and you're always sort of. Um, and I think that this is more damaging to the creative process than anything, you know, is, is this sort of like negotiating the social space and, and the fear of like uh, what other people think of you, the desire to get them to like you and, and stuff like this, because, um, you know, yeah. So I, I, I think um, I think that that concerns me more than the attention span thing, um, because people will just adapt to I don't know, like, right. I think I don't think that it's. Yeah, it, it also reminds me always of like. Um, Oh God, who was it? Was it like Socrates who would, who, who would, who would, who would say like, you know, he was, who was against, I can't, maybe it's, I think it was Socrates who was, uh, you know, he thought the written word was bad because it would like, yeah, I think it was Socrates. Right. Yeah. He would, because it would decrease people's ability to like remember stuff and like, he's maybe right, but it ultimately doesn't really matter in my opinion. Like I yeah. think the written word is good. I think it's good to, you know, read and write stuff down. And so I, it, I think like the, the the sort of new technology is is somewhat similar to that, you know. And then the other thing too is that you know there are like like lectures online on YouTube and stuff that are like four hours long, or like podcasts that are super long, and people they get millions and millions of views, you know. Yeah. And so it's people can pay attention to stuff, you know. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't really see it. I mean, it, it, social media is distracting, blah blah blah. But I but I don't, it doesn't really concern me that much. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You know, a uh, um, funny visual thought just came to mind. Uh, what is it? Satana? Satana sounds like, I just thought that sounds like some kind of like uh, internal code name Facebook project that they're working <laughs> yeah. on to like make the feed more addictive and then they'll like, yeah. launch it as another name. But that's exactly what like it sounds like, right? That's um, true. That's true. That's very <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah. I can never remember. I can never remember if it's Dia, Dia, Diabolos, like for the devil or Satanas. One of them means the scatterer, and one of them means the accuser. And I can never remember. And social media has a bunch of both, you know. But um, yeah, uh, but yeah. But no, I, I that that's that makes so much sense. I love what you said. Uh, it, it's really about what people are paying attention to. The thing that does get to me sometimes, I do feel like, right? If we think about. You know, uh, if we just like borrow from, I don't know, um, uh, warfare metaphors for a second, and we think about like attention as a battle, right? Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's an unfair fight now, for sure, mm -hmm. right? And it's mm -hmm. becoming increasingly unfair as well, right? Like you have these armies of like engineers, data scientists, psychologists who basically almost like mapped the psyche for better or for worse. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's, every time you go on your feet, that's like, you know, uh, 150 of the smartest people in the world armed with a hundred billion dollars against like a 16 year old, right? <laughs> Who's trying to get totally. off the feet and maybe just focus. And that gets to me. I feel like that there's something about that, that is just deeply, uh, deeply, you know, unjust just doesn't, doesn't feel right. Definitely. Yeah. And I, it does concern me more when I think about like kids, you know, right. um, like, um, and, and yeah, I think that's, I think that's, uh, I think that's right for sure. For sure. I mean, it is designed to have a specific effect on you. And that effect is like purely to maximize attention and yeah. profit and so on. And I think that, that is definitely damaging and, um, um, 
you know, but I, but I also, but I still, I mean, I still, and I don't know if it's my impulse to like defend technology or something like that, but I, I do, I do feel like <laughs> sort of like one manifestation of something that's always existed or something that's deeper. Definitely. You know? Um, so, but yeah, that, 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 that being said, uh, I've gotten off social media a couple of times for like 40 day periods. And, and it's always been like, uh, I got, uh, last year I got, I, I got off social media for Lent and I was like, um, I found myself like writing poems with like garden metaphors and stuff like that. And I was like, what the hell, you know, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. No, it definitely, it, it definitely rewires you, right. The more time you're spending, um, in these spaces. Um, and I'm with you as well, by the way, that was just, just a perspective. I think like the issue with a lot of, uh, technology and especially, a lot of people's response to it, especially the literary world, is that it's so like, I don't know, there's almost like, uh, it's, it's really divisive. Um, it's really, really yeah. combative, right? Um, and the reality is uh, that, as you said, I don't really think, I feel like it's the reincarnation of the same problem since Socrates, right? Like, here's this new mm. thing, right? Um, we also forget, like, every everything at one point was a really cutting edge piece of technology, right? Like the written word or like pen and paper, which... Mm maybe feel like these classical, beautiful objects to us, right? That don't have anything to do with the world of technology. At one, at one point that was absolutely bleeding edge and really, really scary. Um, and it's kind of useful lens, I think, to think about it like that, because you realize that whilst the object, right, um, may be changing, um, the psychology and the response to the object is like, it's, it's pretty evergreen. Right. Um, we just give it a new name, yeah. like AI or web three or whatever. Like it's, it's, yeah, people yeah. are threatened and afraid and difficult to make sense of and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, any I think any with any new technology, the way that it like emerges in history or something is going to be kind of rocky. You know what I mean? Right. It's going to have good and bad aspects to it. And, you know, I, I think part of my impulse to to because def- I, I, I agree that it's had like a lot of deleterious like effects. But I, I also just personally like I feel like I do see so many people wanting to like absolve themselves of their responsibility for their own <laughs> response. To things, you know what I mean? Where it's like, absolutely. I don't, they, you know, it's like you, you can just you can just hear the cope or the, the excuse in people's voices when they like, you know, oh, my God, uh, all this stuff is so bad. And like to me, you know, it's like we'll log off. You know what I mean? Right. Um, you, know, you know, you know, um, so, yeah. No, that makes 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 total sense. Um, should we backtrack a little bit even before social media and um i've already mentioned your novel uh love for you to talk about it and tell whoever's listening to this a little bit about it because uh, i've read it and i think i think it's absolutely uh wonderful very very clever super entertaining um i think i mentioned the email to you as well that like for me it was just like i don't know man psychologically just disorientating right like the um barrage of excruciating details uh at times it was really lulling and endearing at times it was like super numbing um threatening felt like uh mm-hmm. my my neighbor um we're very close uh, my wife and i we have basically like our super close friends next door in in mumbai um and one of them's a script uh, she's a screenwriter Hi. um and uh, i shared your book with her and uh, it was just this morning actually she was telling me how she felt like it was a personal attack on her creative process because she felt like how has he done this right like this is this is making me feel so bad about like uh you know um hold on well i wanted to ask you though why did she say why she felt like it was like uh an indictment of her creative process or an attack on her so i I think she met it in a in a very loving (laughs) and endearing sense um, so I think her uh, big issue with the internet is, is Instagram, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the fact that like, she's just, her subconscious is essentially completely hijacked, right? Like she'll open the app, not sure why she opened it, spend a little bit of time in it, see something and then leave only to re-enter moments l- later under a slightly, yeah. slightly different context. Um, yeah. And then an hour and a half later, she's like still doing that. And in that time, it's not as if like you can go back to just being completely focused, like your creative energy is somewhat dissipated, scattered, right? If you will. Um, And she feels like she's just lost command and control of the day and then sit at one, 2 a.m. and like bash out a script till the morning. 
Um, so I think that's where she right, was coming right. from. She's only a couple of chapters in, mind you, but yeah, she felt like, okay, this is, yeah. this is uh, scary how he's, how he's done this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, I, so yeah, the novel takes place over the course of just a few hours while the narrator is like trying and failing to work on his novel, um, and getting distracted by social media. Um, and I think a part of the impetus for the book was that I, it was the same with me, you know, like I, I would like wake up in the morning, like kind of like intent on having a productive morning. Um, and it would like almost invariably get derailed by like scrolling or, you know, uh, thinking about different things that I saw on social media. And like, like my day would almost instantly become kind of like cramped uh, and scattered and, and, and uh, you know, just full of like distracting bullshit. Um, and part of what I wanted to do was like, observe what was actually happening when when that would happen because like you said like you know it's 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 i feel like what you you know using social media it sort of is becomes this place i mean i know i just said well then just log off but at the same time <laughs> like in some way in some ways you can't just log off because like once you kind of get sucked into it and i do think you yeah. get sucked into it um sort of choice becomes like almost ambiguously non-existent you know what i mean like where you are making these decisions or you're at least taking these actions but it's not as if you're saying okay i'm gonna open instagram now and and you know lose 30 minutes of my day or whatever um and so it's sort of like um, i wanted to like describe concretely like what's actually happening because there are all kinds of cliches that you can use to talk about this and all kinds of like hackneyed internet writing or whatever but i thought like if i just pay close attention um you know then maybe something good will come of it and um you know and i was reading like all kinds of like philosophy of mind stuff and all kinds of like just a bunch of different stuff trying to like really like understand how it could be that like you know i could be doing something one moment and then like three and a half minutes later I've like opened and closed Twitter three times and navigated to Instagram and like had these thoughts about these random people. And then I'm like, Oh, you know, like just sort of shook out of it, like in a stupor or something. Um, and so, yeah, the novel sort of came, came, came about as a, in part as a result of that, um, you know, but then also I realized that the sort of conceit of the novel made it nice so that I could like have all these various, like, you know, they could go a bunch of places where he, you know, I could I could basically just insert rants that I wanted to insert and stuff like that, which was which was fun. So cool. You know, I, I really love the fact it's funny, like when you talk about paying close attention, um, you have an almost a very extremely literal and mechanical sense, right? It's not just like witnessing and observing a person through a moving through a morning and the different shades of a morning. It is literally like yeah, the to to just an excruciating, painful um, level of detail. Um, mm. And what I found interesting about it is that it's almost so, so mechanical that it just becomes like and feels super poetic, right? Um, I mm. felt like there's this weird, almost Zen uh, meditational quality about it. Like you're just mm. reading it. And, and uh, yeah, I've not figured out whether that's, a nice feeling like lulling right or is it is it numbing and and i think that's why it's so interesting as well it, it is just like it's it's for me it was very disorientating honestly i've not read something in a while that i've just felt like i don't really know how to feel about this but like i i thoroughly enjoyed it mm, mm, mm. was all of this intentional by the way what i'm saying or was, was this like i, I you, authors get this question all the time right i'm sure there's some stuff that people tell you and you're like oh cool i had that wasn't the intention but I'm glad that's what it did for you. Or was this actually quite, quite, uh, quite by design? Well, I think, I think one of the things that I, that I wanted to do was to sort of like have, because I was aware that like the, the quote unquote plotlessness of the book, <clears throat> um, the just conceit of it in general could be, <laughs> could feel boring, you know, or I was aware that like, I don't know. I, I was, I, one of the things that I did focus on, it wasn't so much like wanting to like, like lull the reader or something like this, but it was more like I wanted the sentences to like propel the reader forward to where like, even though it's describing like, you know, mundane things like making coffee or tea or like using social media, I still wanted the sentences. I think it really happened on like a craft sentence level where it's like, I want, 
you know, the, the reader to sort of feel propelled forward by the, by the sentences and stuff. And so like things like the refrain of like the thwarted desire of like wanting to write and not writing or like, you know, the, you know, clicking here, clicking there. Like, I think, um, um, I wanted it to like suck, suck, suck the reader in for, for better or for worse, it's kind of similarly to how social media you know, <laughs> sort of sucks you in, but, but, but hopefully, hopefully to a better end, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, and the, and, and the, like, what, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I had a half formed thought. So please, please go. <laughs> Uh, and then the machine, like you're talking about the, the sort of mechanical quality and stuff like that. Like I was definitely aware of like in the, I think you mentioned this to me in our email, but like in the first sentence, you know, how he like says like his fingers were clacking like a machine or something like clacking that. Clacking with aware. the determination of a machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so I, I was like aware um, you know, cause there are all these ways that we use social media, but then there are all these ways that social media uses us. And I yeah. think like increasingly, um, you know, the, my wife was telling me about something, I don't remember the name, but like, there's some kind of test, uh, with AI, maybe, you know, about this, this test with AI or something to like figure out how cl similar, how close it is to like Turing test. Actual yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. I thought it was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and how, how increasingly like people are failing the test. Oh yeah. Um, which, which I thought was, I didn't know that before writing the book, but I thought that was interesting and, and, um, yeah, and kind of relevant. It's something uh, I like to think about quite a bit actually, just cause, uh, of the work that I'm currently writing and also just kind of like my, my journey over the last like seven, eight years, building uh, a technology product, never really identified much as a technologist, to be honest, it's even now, like hype, uh, our products, they started as like literary creative exercises with a friend in a tea shop, right. Just like writing some haiku in a notebook, um, just cause it was fascinating to see like how a thought would return to you completely, evolved or devolved or in a completely different direction. Right. Um, but yeah, I've been thinking a lot about it as we built uh, haiku jam, our collaborative poetry app. Um, so you mentioned the Turing test. I did this fun little, uh, it was almost a presentation stunt. I remember it was a, in a, I think an investor meeting in Mumbai. So at this point we were, a lot of people were writing in haiku jam. I think there'd been like a million uh, or 10 million lines published in, in the app. Um, and we were getting a little bit more sophisticated with things like, data science, right? It, because for the longest time, it was just the wild west, right? And which was mm. very cool and fascinating. But like when you have 100,000 people writing together, right, in, in, in a shared space, um, that sounds like really like idyllic and beautiful, but oftentimes it is absolutely crazy, right? Um, and in a very, very sort of subtle and nuanced way, we found that like you know, um, you, 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 you were, you found that we found that like there were three people, right. Um, writers who were being sort of matched and brought together and they were all great writers, right. It's not as if that they couldn't write, they were writing really, really interesting things. Um, but they were just in completely different wavelengths, right? Like there was, let's say a 17 year old girl in Malaysia who'd just broken up with her first boyfriend. And she was just there, like really, really just like, you know, um, for her, it was an emotional outlet. And she was getting matched with, let's say, a really, really sort of, I don't know, conniving, cutting uh, comedian, right? Who's just like mm -hmm. determined to create a lot of sort of like really snarky political content. Um, both of them were writing interesting things, but together it was just like a, a kind of proverbial train crash, right? And we found that like, mm -hmm. okay, this, and it was really affecting like the experience for a lot of people. And we really, we're trying to figure out how, how do you solve this problem beyond just like, design, right? And communications and things like that. Um, so we, we, we went down this data science, uh, AI rabbit hole. Um, we just started building a little team uh, of testing, you know, running experiments across lots of like uh, millions of lines of, of collaborative haiku. Um, and we ended up building these like little AI poets that could literally write with people, right? They were trained off like eventually the hundred million lines, <laughs> um, of, mm -hmm. of, of, uh, um, expression and they could write with people. And I ran this little, uh, presentation just to investors, um, with a bunch of like, you know, haiku collaborative poems on a, on a slide. I'm like, can you, can you guess which one were written by uh, humans and which one were written by like the machines that we've made? Um, and almost no one could, it was like, if anything, the machine generated expression was like 
yeah, they, they, they thought humans had done that because uh, one thing I found really interesting right now is that um, because it's still so, I don't know if it's because it's so nascent, but the fact is that a lot of this stuff we're discussing is really nascent, right? Like it's really, really new, just like a couple of years and, and it's evolving every single day. Um, AI, it's it's like almost, it's super unhinged almost by design. Like there's some, you, you read an AI generated paragraph and it might be metaphorically beautiful, but there's something about it you're like, that just feels like somehow it's inhuman, right? Because, just because of like the freshness of the perspective. Um, and I'm actually pers personally, I'm quite excited by that because I feel like it's almost like, um, you know, a young child that isn't filled with any bias and it's just asking questions and navigating and negotiating the, the world around it. Um, no question is too dumb, right? Like, um, and, and, and everything is almost coming from this, this very pure space of like first principles. Um, and I feel like to some degree, that's where machines are at right now. Like everything is really, really new. Everything is remarkably fresh. Um, and, uh, and it seems to have kind of like a unique voice. I don't know if that will stay or go over time, because I think there seems to be a group of people that are determined to like humanize it, right? Like we need to, you know, humanize this for like business purposes or chatbots or customer support and the rest of it. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just, uh, just, just thoughts. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It, it, um, I'm not super familiar with 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 like um, you know, AI writing and so on. But some of my friends have written poems. Um, my friend Honor Levy wrote some poems that were like half her and half AI, and they were yeah. amazing. Right, I, I agree. You know, it, it's like um, her writing is kind of unhinged, uh, and fresh or whatever in a uh, already. You know, but the but 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 I love them, and like you know, someone sent me uh something the other day about some ai technology and they were like novels are next man like you know you're going to be out of business and I, and you know part of me was just like you know but if, if if people could feed in like my favorite novelist into an ai thing and like you know make something new from it like i you know it might be great i don't <laughs> i don't know yeah, yeah. you know it might, might be fun to read you know um i think um yeah, so it's hard to. I I don't know very much about about the technology. I'm not I'm not a I'm not a, a pessimist, but I'm also not really an optimist. Like I just sort of feel like it. Uh, it just doesn't have much to do with what I'm with what I'm with what I'm doing. But I. Yeah. But I. Uh, but I'm interested to see what what comes of it. You know, for sure. From from whatever I've seen and understood and also through just previous guests on this this podcast as well who are really deep into it um, it sounds like uh novels are still really far away <laughs> right yeah um, okay. I, I think I, I, yeah it's not a case of just like, pushing a button and, yeah look, look man i think this 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 is actually really interesting there's so many layers to it right i feel like um one layer is is design intention Right. Um, I've always had I always take an issue with the statement like the future is this or the future right. is that. Right. Because I feel like, no, uh -huh. the future, it's a future, not the future. Right. A future can be anything. Um, and it's forged by like, you know, it, it's a consequence of the decisions that we make today. Um, and there's there's great ways where you can design technology. Right. To bring people together, to foster connection, um, to unlock like expression and and help uh yeah um you know build it with really sort of collaborative intentions as you're describing like your your friend right um and then there's a really really sort of nasty satanic way to build technology so i think a lot of it comes down to design intentions today um and then the second piece is like if we look at other spaces that ai is apparently like eating up like chess Right. Like, OK, machines apparently now, I think, better than humans at chess, like the, the world chess champion can't like beat uh, a machine trained on so much like previous data. Um, but people still play chess, right? Chess is chess is still a pretty interesting game <laughs> to play, um, to even yeah, observe, I mean, watch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing, too, is like, I think. Um, if anything, right, there's there's a there's a. Uh, there's a great uh, part in this book, uh, Orthodoxy, by the writer G.K. Chesterton, and he he says that like insanity is not a, a lack of rationality, but it's like a hyper abundance of rationality and like right. too small of a, 
in too small of an imaginative scope. And so like he uses the example, he's like, you know, it's not generally speaking like poets or painters that go insane. Uh, although some of course do, but it's, it's, it's yep. usually like chess masters or mathematicians or things <laughs> like this. And I think like, you know, one of the sort of dreams of our kind of like modern rationalist, self-enlightened, you know, uh, uh, whatever, uh, culture is that like, you know, if only we can become more rational and if only we can kind of figure everything out, then like, you know, we'll reach this sort of state of utopia or whatever. And I just don't, I don't really believe that. Like, I think that, um, you know, our, our reason is like sort of embedded in something larger and more dynamic and living. And I don't know that AI, you know, one of the things that I've thought, you know, because people, philosophers and so on have thought like, well, the thing that makes us different from animals is our like capacity for reason. Yeah. But like, I, but to me though, when I look at nature, it's like, it's like, it's mechanically reasonable. It's very reasonable. But the thing that, 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 that animals can't do is they like, can't like spiritually rebel. They can't like, you know, it's almost like you could do the dark, you know, they can't, you know, they can't act in opposition to what they should do, you know, generally speaking. And I think, but we can, right. Like I can, you know, I can, I can, I can see the good and choose, choose, choose something else. You know, I can like, yep. uh, do something that's against my best self-interest and not know why I did it and then feel tortured by it or something like that. And, and, um, you know, I think it would be very hard for like a machine to, like, I can't imagine a machine with that capability, you know, without a sort of spirit or a soul. I mean, not to sound trite, but, <laughs> um, you know, you know, and so, and so like, I just, I, and, and so I feel, I do feel like a lot of what people are trying to articulate when they're afraid of technology or whatever is like what you're talking about where, you know, there's like a spirit animating it. Like people are sort of making choices behind the scenes and so on. And like, if it's, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's evil then it's evil, but if it's good, then it's good, you know? And, and, and I think both can, there are both possibilities. Yeah. There's a, um, uh, there's a book that I'm uh, reading, which I really, really love um, by uh, Ruth Ozeki, uh, book of the book of form and emptiness. Um, she's okay. like, uh, uh, the author, she's a, uh, I think she's like, she's, she's a wonderful, wonderful novelist. Um, and she's also, a, um, a Zen priest, right. Okay. Um, and comes from, I think she's like Japanese Canadian, um, and, uh, from, you know, Buddhist tradition. Um, and she talks a lot about objects, right. And the consciousness within objects and how like in Japan, right. Um, strong tradition in Shintoism of like animism. Right, that there is a spirit in in absolutely everything. Um, I found what you said really, really interesting because I feel like this uh, either perspective works, like all perspectives. Either anything can really be okay, right? <laughs> Depending on how you wield it. Um, what I what I love about the idea and concept of animism is that it does seem to inspire some kind of like reverence for objects. Mm. This is, right? this is so funny. Me, me and my wife were literally just arguing about this just the other day in the car. Oh, really? It's so funny, but go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. She said it, almost exactly what you just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. No, that, I, no, I'm really glad that you did because my my wife, she is like, uh, she has almost, I think, reinforced my belief in animism because she and her mother, they're literally like objects are real, right? Like um, to give you an example, like we are moving countries right now and packing up a bunch of stuff and have to figure out like what stuff are we going to sort of internationally ship because it's pretty expensive and what stuff are we just going to give to friends or whatever right and you think that the approach should be a very rational one like we can use this we won't use this we can get these books there whatever. and it's more and I just saw her like hand on the bookshelf the other day saying no no she's not she's not happy about staying here I think she needs to come with us and I was like huh I love that. I, mean, I, I, I think more than the almost like cuteness of it, I think uh, I personally in my life would like to have more reverence for objects totally. and material things, right? Um, I'm generally yeah, yeah. not out of any virtue or anything. I've not really ever been very attached to things. Um, have a couple of objects in my life. I have like a very beautiful motorcycle that I adore. Um, but most things I'm like pretty chill about. I don't really care about like other, other things, but I know that I'm like, again, it's not out of being virtuous. It's just a lot of it is just being unconscious um, and a bit yeah, tunnel visioned. Yeah. Right. So what I do love about the idea of, of, you know, seeing a spirit in a thing is that like it, it does. Yeah. It 
inspires maybe just a little bit of respect for that object and the way that you use it, the way that you treat it, the way that you maintain it. Um, and Ruth Ozeki, I think she she talked about this in her, I think it was a previous no novel, A Tale for the Time Being. She talks about how like in Japan, they have these ceremonies for objects that you no longer use, right? Like um, if you have a, a pair of scissors, right? That's mm -hmm. now just like dysfunctional after 10 years of use. Um, I think they, they they take it to like a monastery and stick it in a big block of tofu, right? Um, oh, wow. To yeah. to like, to, so that the object, I, I'm forgetting the metaphor, but I think it treats you well in the afterlife, right? And it doesn't come back and like stab you or um, <laughs> yeah. or cut you, right? Um, which, yeah, yeah. I, I find that really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I um, that's, uh, Nicola, uh, my wife was also saying something similar, you know, where she was, um talking about how like you know if you have a sort of a, a animistic perspective whatever you know it, it, if you have a perspective of animism like then yeah it, it sort of directly leads to this kind of reverence i tend to think that there is something qualitatively different about humans and other other uh, other like objects and so on but i but i think that there's still a way like in, you know we're, we're we're both uh christian and i think there is still a way of getting to like reverence for like animals and objects and so on. Like if you, if you, if you view the world as like, you know, in created by God or, you know, in view, you know, like as good because God's creation is good and so on, then like you could still have reverence for it because even if the thing itself doesn't have like, um, you know, like I, I, I think there's like a qualitative difference between like me and like this dresser or something like yeah. that, but I can still, you know, but I can still, but I can still like, uh, treat the dresser reverently I can still like not bash it with a you know with a with a baseball bat or something when I'm done with it or you know slam the drawers or something um, and I think that like for me um, it's in part about what what it does the way I treat objects is in part um, or animals or something like that um, you know if I treat an animal cruelly it does something to my spirit you know it does something to my I was just psyche. gonna say exactly yeah, yeah exactly you know and and that's sort of like um that's a bad effect i mean besides the fact that the animal is like a living thing worthy of respect in some ways i just i just read uh for the first time the brothers karamazov karamazov um by dostoevsky and i i absolutely loved it and there's this great bit in it where the um it's like the one of the sons is a monk and he has like the he he takes notes about like the his elders teaching or whatever and he says like um you should you should beg forgiveness from the birds because the birds can't go so low as to sin like you they're sinless you know what i mean <laughs> wow. they can't, you know so he's like you should fall on the ground and beg forgiveness from the earth and beg forgiveness from the birds um because you know they could never stoop so low as to like the darkest depths of like a human heart or something like that and i thought you know like they're all i think i think and i think a lot of you know i think i think um but 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 definitely um i think the perspective of animism or whatever is is better than just one of kind of like this brutal uh irreverence you know i think um where you're just kind of using things for your own your own ends and you know and so on so yeah i'm with you man i feel like and this is exactly what i meant that any perspective can work right um i feel like sometimes we get way too attached to like uh metaphors or perspectives and i feel mm -hmm. like hey, let's almost uh, abstract away a little bit and just see, is it, is it pragmatic, right? Is it, is it taking us to a place of like happiness or bliss, right? Mm. If it is, or collective bliss, individual bliss, if it is, then hey, it's, that's a good thing, right? Um, I feel the same just sometimes about technology as well. When people, had, uh, there, was a, there was this piece of news, I forget when it was, I think a few weeks ago about like this, um, Google AI, right? And one of the engineers was claiming that like, hey, this thing is now sentient, right? It has like the, the kind of intelligence of a seven or eight year old. And it was, a lot of people were sort of up in arms about this, right? Um, and yeah, interesting debate um, from a number of different lenses, ethics, technology, right? Um, but sometimes I feel like, you know, if something is helping us individuals uh, experience the world in maybe a little bit more technicolor whether we want to get caught up about whether it's alive not alive sentient not sentient sometimes i feel like it, it doesn't matter too much right as long as mm. as long as it's sort of uh 
bringing the best out of us and moving us towards a place of like harmony. I think, I think that's a great thing. Um, and it doesn't really matter think, like yeah. how, how you get there. Right. Mm. Yeah. I think, I think, I think I agree with some of what you said and maybe, maybe disagree with some of it. Cause I, cause I do think, I think please disagree. All, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I think that there are all these ways in which like, there can be like an apparent good or like, you know, things can seemingly be bringing us towards something better, but at the same, but like, because our perspective is like cramped or broken or like yeah. uh, or something like that, then like, you know, it's not always apparent what's actually helping. So like if something helps in the short term, will help in the long term. You know, it's hard to make, it's hard to like make these sort of like utilitarian like calculations, you know? And I think it's, it, it is, I think it's true. Like, I don't know. I, I think that there are like, there, you know, there, I believe that there is like a reality and that like there are all these different ways of describing it you know and i think some are better than others and and so on but i think for me like there's like there's something true about like there's something paradoxical often about like um about uh about that reality and so like you know like where 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 it might seem you know it might uh something might seem good to me it doesn't make it like good or whatever like i i like i i would i i there was like a um uh i think when you were emailing me you mentioned like uh wanting to talk about like individualism or you know if we're more individualistic than than in the past or something and to me like i think that we are like sort of we live in a time where like you know you create your own reality and yep. you you sort of like you know you there there's like a a sartre quote where he says like um, you know, there's sort of like, I am myself. It's a sort of like circular thing or whatever, but I can also, I, I create myself and I create my destiny and I create my world or whatever. Um, and I think that there's an aspect of that, like what you were saying before, where it's like, you know, the future is created by choices and like we have control over some of these choices and stuff. But I also think there's like in a sort of broader metaphysical sense or something like that. Um, um, you know, I don't create myself. I didn't create myself. You know, um, I, I don't sustain, I don't like, I don't, I'm not like when I'm asleep, I'm not like, uh, all right, I'm going to wake myself up in the morning, you know, like, I mean, yeah, I do yeah. wake up, but it's not, you know what I mean? And, and so I yeah. think like, um, and so I think, I can't remember, I can't remember what I was, what I was on about, but I think that anyway, I think, I think there are like sort of paradoxes that um that the utilitarian like viewpoint can't really account for. And it, and it also can't really account for just how I have a very pessimistic view of like, of, uh, of in some ways a very pessimistic view of humanity, you know, as this like violent, tortured, warring, you know, <laughs> evil, you know, whatever, yeah. like, like where, you know, where it's like, so like, you know, if I, you know, and so I think that that's like embedded in, in sort of like the structure of, 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 of myself or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, so I think there has to be something transcendent, like a transcendent good or a transcendent, ideal or something like that, 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 that sort of, sort of guides, uh, you know, guides, guides me. I don't disagree with you at all. I don't disagree yeah, yeah, with you I, at I, all. I, kind of went I feel like, place, but. um, you know, I find, I find like, uh, like literally perspective, a really, really interesting thing. Um, something I was think journaling about the other day, uh, I found that, you know, if you zoom in to, let's say, an atom. Um, oh, they, yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. feels something like really perfect, right? And, and harmonious mm -hmm. about that. Um, and then if you zoom out and literally the Milky Way and you just see the world, just that like little pale blue dot, there's also something really beautiful and perfect. And I, I, at least for me, something like there's a sense of harmony. Um, and it's the middle. Oh. Right. That seems like, man, this is this is a really messed up place. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, not, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, yeah, I, I exactly still don't right. know what exactly. I think about that. I don't know how I feel about that, but I I, I, I'm, I feel like it is a paradox. And those uh, those um, contradictions just coexist. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, totally. I also I also sometimes wonder why, 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 why can truth not be contradictory? Right. Why do we assume that like. It isn't yeah. right. Um, when well, it, or like or or like I think a lot of the time what we call contradiction is really just a paradox or like the, you know there can be like things existing alongside each other and there can be something overarching that incorporates both. You know what I'm saying? And it's not. Um, um, have you heard of like infinite universe theory? Do you know about this? Uh, not in depth. 
not in yeah, depth. I don't, I, don't it, but it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about it in depth either, but it's basically like the idea that like, you know, if you zoom in as much as you can zoom in, you sort of like encounter infinity or something like that. And then, um, you know, if you zoom out, it's the same. Um, so you can kind of encounter the same thing both ways. Um, and we were actually talking about it in terms of, I thought of infinite novel theory where like, because my novel is so like, uh, zoomed in you know um but still dealing with some of these broader yep. themes and my friend's novel was so zoomed out spanning millennia and prehistory and so on um but they're sort of getting at very similar uh similar ideas so um but that's interesting what you say about the middle it reminded me my my uh my friend wrote this book that hasn't been published called lust for life and the narrator is a pedophile priest um wow. <laughs> Shouts out to Michael Clean. He's a, um, but he, 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 it starts off with this great bit where like, well, you know, great. It's a very dark book. It's very funny, but like the, the priest is talking about, he's like, he's like in the priest lifestyle, it's all highs and lows, you know, but for most people it's the middle. And he talks about the high of like smoking crack and like, uh, you know, and like uh, whatever uh, molesting kids or something. And then the low of like getting caught or whatever and realizing, um, but I just thought it was, it was funny, you know, and he was, he was just, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, we can either, we, yeah, I'm, 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 a the, the priest book, I'm, I'm starting a press and I'm hoping to put it out, but we'll see. We'll see. It's, it's been a slog. You were talking about like, uh, you know, the, yeah, whatever. It's very diff, diff, it's a difficult process, but yeah, <laughs> trying to get it together. Yeah. Well, I'd love to read it. And, uh, see, Hey, so on the subject of priests that, to crack, right? Um, if you're comfortable sharing, uh, love to hear more yeah. about maybe your journey with drugs, especially in the context of your writing. I know you've talked about this in the past and it was just something something on my mind. I was really, really, really curious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 uh, I started like using drugs and drinking like almost daily when I was like 15 or 14 or something like that. Um, and, uh, I got sober initially in like 2014, 2013. Um, uh, I've been clean and sober for like 99% of that time. Like I had a couple of very brief relapses, but I, um, um, yeah, it's funny. I, I originally wanted to delete all the mentions of drug use in the book. Um, right. I don't know. I don't know why I, but I, I, um, I think I don't know. I well, like you know, getting be, being addicted to drugs and getting sober, sort of like it was really the first time. Um, you know, when I was younger, I was like very like, kind of intellectually ambitious and like kind of like arrogant and like I thought that I had it. You know, I mean, it's just not uncommon, you know, but I thought <laughs> I sort of had everything figured out and so on and so forth. Um, and I think like uh, getting sober and sort of the process of like of like you know wanting to stop using drugs, not being able to. Um, you know, eventually being able to, and then realizing that there was like all of these contradictory things inside of me that like, I couldn't just think my way out of, I think, um, I think it sort of helped my writing a lot because it, it sort of, you know, one of the things that happened when I was working on the novelist was, um, you know, I wrote a draft and it was full of like rants about people and about things. And then I put it away for a little while. And when I came back to it, I sort of like, could see that a lot of it was, I was full of shit, you know, and a lot of it. And I think be, being able to, being able to um, have a kind of mental like framework or like mechanism to like be able to um, like be willing to see that like there are times when I'm, when I'm full of shit, totally wrong or times when I like need a perspective that isn't my own um, was something that I think I first learned in, you know, trying to get sober, but I think like I continually, um, you know, learn and relearn, um, especially through, through writing, like, um, uh, this guy like Rene Girard has a, has an idea that where he says like the novel's first draft and the novelist's first draft is always an attempt at self-justification. And then like <laughs> nice. the great novelist eventually, you know, yeah. And then he says the great novelist eventually like, can recognize their own kind of um, uh, can recognize just how this, you know, their own kind of um, uh, how full of shit they are essentially. 
and um, and then he says they can move through this this existential downfall, um, and they can describe the evil of the other from within themselves, you know. And so, like instead of trying to scapegoat someone or something wow. or point the finger outward, they can they can um, you know they can then describe these things that they thought were in others from within the perspective of themselves or the narrator or something, and and that sort of rounds out the full the full picture uh, or a fuller picture. Um, you know, of an experience or of the world or this, you know, person's psychology or something like that. And, um, and it seems, it seems related because I, there, there's, there's, you know, unless you're a great genius, which I don't think that I am, <laughs> um, it's hard to get away with the kind of intellectual hubris or like, um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I just, I, I guess, I guess getting sober, it sort of like was the first time that I had encountered like the idea of humility um, and like really tried to like incorporate it in my like conception of myself and in my life, you know, and cause it's like even learning something, you sort of have to, you know, um, at least, at least to, for me, it's like, even when I read, right. Like I'm trying to understand what's going on in the text. I'm trying to understand what the author's perspective, what they're, what's really, what's going on on the page. And there's this sort of like trend now to just sort of like, you know, uh, uh, you know, look down your nose at these like these writers and mark it up with your red pen and like you have something to teach them, you know. Um, one of the things that helped my writing more than anything was sort of having like a, a reverent and humble attitude toward uh, uh, a lot of the great writers or a lot of writers that I liked and so on and be, being like willing to learn from them as opposed to just thinking that I knew what was up and what was good yeah. and that I could just sort of. You know, um, and so I think that's somehow related to to my journey with with addiction and recovery, but um, maybe in a more roundabout way. That's beautiful, man. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, yeah, no problem. All right, yeah. this has been awesome, dude. I mean, a couple of just just for fun, um, and uh, I ask these. It's a very stereotypical thing to do on a podcast, just like quick fire stuff at the end. But I found that it's incredibly useful for me. Like I almost always pick up one of like the book recommendations and it's, it's a great like couple of minutes just for my own personal book discovery. Right. So just a couple of quick uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. lightning questions. Right. Um, this is a tough one. I imagine uh, for someone as well read as you, but like a book of fiction that's had a really, really profound impact on you. Um. It, it is tough. Well, one of the reasons why it's tough is because I recognize that this is like, uh, I'm aware of sounding like cliche. I mean, crime and punishment was huge for me by Dostoevsky. <laughs> and, I, you know, um, and so was Notes from Underground. Really, those two books together, I think, like really, really, really had an impact on not just on my writing, uh, but also just on my on my life in general, for sure. Yeah. Amazing. No, no, I, I, I don't. Honestly, I don't think it's cliche at all they are remarkable pieces of literature for a reason right <laughs> um yeah, yeah, i have always yeah, 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 exactly. i've always found that i'm just yeah, like i suffer out. from a lot of um go ahead oh i was just gonna say and he's sort of fallen out of fashion so in some ways i have to reclaim uh i've got to let everybody know that yeah. he's still great 100 yeah, yeah, exactly. percent. i love that um th this is qu this question i always find that I, i'm I, I realize uh I'm just plagued by like recency bias, right? Because there's there's books that have a profound impact on on me like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But I'm always like, uh, I don't know. I, I found that like, I enjoy most of the stuff I read. And sometimes I feel that social pressure that I need to be more critical, right? <laughs> I need to I need to be more critical mm -hmm. and I need to like dislike certain things. I, I, I shouldn't always like really enjoy it. But I always find that like, in most of the stuff that you read, there's always something, right? And I think I'm I'm really sort of like forgiving as a reader, as as well, mm -hmm. just naturally. So I, I like I'm like I'm willing to put myself through like torture, um, you know, for mm -hmm. the first hundred pages, and because I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. Someone has put the, you know, writing books is not easy. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of a lot of effort and commitment. I really feel like a bit of an empath in moment in, in moments of reading. Um, so anyway, when I'm, whenever I'm, uh, I'm asked this question or I ask this question to myself, it's always like the last thing I've read and how this one part of it was like, uh, really, really life-changing for me. Anyway. What would you, uh, what would your answer to the question be? What would you, what would your answer to that question be? 
Wow, that's a that's a good one. Right now, um, okay, I'm not just saying this to to flatter you, but the novelist, right? Uh, and I'm not just saying that to flatter you. Um, just yeah. just just factor in the recency bias. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm kidding. I, yeah, I love yeah, it, yeah, honestly. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, I I really feel like thank you. It's just. Uh, I like those books that disorientate you. There's a bit of a mind warp, right? Like you just don't know really mm. know how to think, how to feel. Um, and then just the fact that like the the sheer ambition of the project, um, not easy, man, right? Just just not yeah. easy at all to like yeah, compress. Yeah, right. Um and uh yeah, when I when I first heard yeah. about it, I kind of like before even reading the article or reading more about the book or getting it, I was just thinking like how how would that work? And I, and I, I, I kind of hypothesize that I imagine he's been like really mechanical about it, right? Like every single thing mm -hmm. in that morning has been like mapped, written down and is a node for like play, right? A node for like some kind of metaphorical thought or expression or rabbit hole, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, not easy to pull off, not easy to pull off, um, at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think I mentioned this in the email as well, right? Like the fact that I, you know, um, I thought it was really, it was a very, very poetic book, at least for me. Like um, when I found out that um, I didn't actually know, you know, uh, you Thank were a you. poet, right? Um, when when I read it and I kind of like, when I researched you afterwards for this podcast, I was like, oh, okay, it, it doesn't surprise me. It didn't come as like a shock that you wrote poetry before this. I thought that makes sense because um, it was also pretty like, you know, efficient book as well. Like it kept the, the you know, it, mm -hmm. there wasn't a plot, but the morning kept like moving forwards, right? You just kept moving through that very, very painful morning with, with that person. So with the protagonist. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I really loved it. I really loved it. Um, Thanks. just to I, prove I, that I'm, <laughs> I really, I really appreciate it. Um, there's one more book, which I'll just, just put out there because I was, I was reading it kind of at the same time as I was reading yours is, um, you know, let me just quickly check my phone because I'm blanking on the title. Uh, I do that a lot. I, I often forget. Right? Uh, on, on, yeah, on the, yeah. on the, and it's like, how am I forgetting this? I love it. Yeah, Cat Country by a Chinese author. Uh, I think it was written in the 1930s, Lao Shi. Um, so... So, so basically, the, I, uh, the, the way I discovered this novel, I've got this like little sub stack newsletter about li li live visions, basically this podcast, and also just like just weird literary experiments, right? Um, so I, I send out this Sunday newsletter called News to Novel, which basically like looks at current news events, right? And then recommends novels based on them, right? Because um, I found that one of my like just habits was if I wanted to understand something happening in the world, um, I'd see if I could find some kind of like really interesting, you know, piece of poetry or or a story about it. So I could just get like dive perhaps just mm -hmm. a little bit deeper beyond the the surface what's being presented uh, on on blogs and, and and news sites and stuff. Um, so anyway, there was there was this article about like I think uh, uh, the technology industry in China and the kind of like role of the state in that industry um, and how like powerful the state uh, is in, in, in China. Right. Um, and uh, um, it really just the kind of machinery of government has the ability to clip your wings. Right. Um, as was the case with a lot of companies. So anyway, I just went down this like Chinese uh, sci-fi rabbit hole and I found this book um, by this author. Um, and uh, it's basically um, said in, I think the 1920s, 1930s, like Maoist communist China, um, and the story is that there's a Chinese man um, who's landed on Mars, right? Um, and uh, he's landed in a place called Cat Country, right? Um, and basically these sort of cat humanoid people, right? And it, 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 it's a metaphor. It's like a really, really critical metaphor for like 1930s China, right? So the, the protagonist is really proud to be from China and like, okay, Ch you know, a Chinese man reached Mars, the spaceship crashed. Um, and he's just looking at this, like this, this, uh, this economy and this civilization that is on the verge of like self-destruction. Um, and it's all like really, really sort of vicious cutting lens on, uh, the China that he, he lived in. He was like really culturally like super, super critical, um, and had like a pained life. I think he took his own 
life in the end. Um, but just yeah. really clever, man. Really fun. I, it's really fun, right? Like novels should be fun. I I was just like, this is great, man. Yeah. This is like, uh, you know, um, I don't know if that's weird. I, I feel like Elon Musk should be reading this book, right? He's he's taking us to Mars or something. Like this is a great a great perspective on on uh, on how like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a world build there, right? So highly recommend it. I highly recommend it. I just felt again not something I've not read something like that um uh in a while. Bit of a mind warp. Loved it. It sounds good. It's called a uh, cat country. You said cat country. Yeah, cat country. Cool. Um, and just very it's just very clever because like yeah everything is is like some sort of like social you know like uh tacit social commentary about the china that he lives in uh without saying that it is um it was like a very you, i think uh, it was have, sorry you're a little bit choppy but i was i meant to ask um have you have you read um the book om on ra by victor pelevin no i haven't haven't even heard of it actually it's it's a phenomenal. I haven't read much like sci-fi or speculative fiction, um, but it is a an absolutely phenomenal novel. I can't recommend it enough. And it's like uh, it's also about space travel. It's sort of like a satire of like the USSR space program, um, but it also has to do with like you know consciousness and all this stuff. It's it's a it's a brilliant short little novel, and uh, yeah, it's it's it's. it's it's great. I can't. It's. I can't recommend it enough. I loved it. Thank you, man. I'll. I'll check it out. Yes. Yeah. Li likewise. I, I'm really not read a lot of sci-fi or speculative fiction. Um, but yeah. Uh, Cat Country was really fun, and I'll. I'll check this out as well. Um, cool. cool. Uh, last question. What are, What are you currently reading? Uh, I'm currently reading um, a book called The Courage to Be by Paul Tillich. Um, it's like, uh, he was like a Protestant German theologian in like the middle of the 20th century. And, but it's all about like, uh, it's like, he sort of gives like a broad overview of like the history of the concept of courage at different, you know, at different points. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just now at the point where he's, he's starting to talk about like his sort of positive vision like well, so far it's been like mostly historical and like an analysis of different philosophical traditions and so on but um i'm just now getting to the point where i think he says what he thinks so it's great though it's really good brilliant i think i'll read that as well <laughs> nice nice yeah i yeah i i uh he has another little book called the dynamics of faith which i think he's he's great he's great at like sort of synthesizing ideas and like explaining uh explaining things in a way that i think like for me like a sort of modern reader uh with sort of this modern biases and and stuff can can understand and uh yeah i think he's he's brilliant it's great it's it's really uh um i keep like reading it and like taking these notes like especially when i wake up and read in the morning i sometimes have this bad habit of like uh reading something finding it really compelling and being like i could write an essay about this and then it's like <laughs> wasting like an hour and a half just sort of like uh writing like the sort of like bad philosophical essay i've done this i do this all the time and uh i've never <laughs> produced anything 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 worthwhile doing it um and i'll always be like no oh, like what are you doing she just wakes up after me and i'm like I'm, I'm working on an essay like uh but so far nothing's ever come of it <laughs> i love this uh i don't know what exactly it is but maybe this pressure to like speak or think especially when it's absolutely like not required. Right. Um, I feel it as well. I yeah. feel like I should really have an opinion on this or I should really like write this thread on Twitter or something. And it's like, just write your like goddamn novel, man. Like that's hard enough. Right. Like just, just, <laughs> yeah. you know, live in your little cave. And, I mean, I do, and get I do. Yeah. No, I was just, I do have interest in writing essays and stuff, but it's like, but yeah, so far I've not found any satisfying way to do it, but it's true. I mean, I, it's like, or it'll just be like, you know, I like to take notes when I read, but it's like, uh, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes in the morning before I have like human, human, human contact, I get like all, uh, I get super ambitious about my, uh, you know, about <laughs> what I'm capable of, you know, later in the day I read it and I'm just like, oh man, but, uh, <laughs> I love it. One day, one day, soon. one day, someday, someday. Yeah. Well, this was such a pleasure, man. So much fun. Thank you 
thank you so much for uh, having this conversation. I, ha I had a great time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Me too. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, there are a few simple ways you can show your love. First, do consider leaving a review and subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. This helps more listeners discover it and also just makes me very happy. Second, feel free to share this episode with one friend who loves fiction and you feel might enjoy the conversation. And finally, subscribe to the Lit Visions newsletter on Substack for podcast summaries, future essays, novel recommendations, and discussions about the future of literature. The web address is litvisions.substack.com. Until next time, have a beautiful week filled with fiction and possibilities. <laughs>